Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you how and why it's so important sometimes that we dry glassware before we run reactions in the organic chemistry lab. Before we go any further, it's worth mentioning that water is lurking everywhere in the chemistry lab. It often tags along in organic solvents and can also find its way into reactions through the atmosphere. But for this lecture, we're going to focus on the surface of our glassware. So let's think a little bit about what the surface of glassware really looks like. Although you might find it hard to believe, your glassware contains water, even when it's empty. And in order to understand the reason why, we have to look at our lab glass at the molecular level. So let's zoom in and see what we find. Here we are inside the wall of one of our flasks, and deep within the matrix of that glassware, we find two types of atoms. We find oxygen and silicon. Now, in lab glass, we also find things like sodium and boron, but I'm going to stick to the simplest possible representation here in order to make my point. Now, those silicon atoms are four coordinate atoms. Each one is bonded to four oxygens. And those oxygens are each bonded to two silicon apiece. What that means is that this glassware has a formula of SiO2, or so it would appear from inside the matrix of the glass. But let's see what happens as we move to the edge of the glassware and consider how this network of silicon and oxygen atoms terminates. As we approach the surface, you notice some differences here between the atoms on the edge of the glass and those atoms down inside the matrix of the glass. Most notably, we see some non-binding oxygens, that is oxygens that only have one bond to them and therefore carry a negative charge. We also find silanol groups in which we have an OH bonded to a silicon. The hydrogen here helps to terminate that chain, but it also produces a good hydrogen bonding group. And third, we have some silicon atoms as well. And these three coordinate silica atoms at the edge also have a charge. In this case, they've got a positive charge. So what this means is that the surface of glassware has a tremendous amount of potential to create attractive forces through dipole hydrogen bonding and charge interactions. And of course, we know water is exactly the same. Water has a molecular dipole that can form a strong attraction to those oxygens that don't contain two bonds to silicon. And similarly, it can hydrogen bond to the silanol groups in a variety of ways, again, attaching itself to the surface. And simply by orienting its dipole differently, that oxygen can also interact strongly with three coordinate silicon atoms. So what are we to do to try to be sure that all of this water that is adhered to the surface of our glassware isn't getting into our reaction? The answer is we flame dry. In order to illustrate this, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. In the first video, I have a Bunsen burner and I've set that Bunsen burner to have a nice, well-defined cone in the middle of the flame. The temperature in that cone is about 300 degrees centigrade. Not hot enough to melt my glassware, but hot enough to drive the water off. So as I place that glassware into the cone of the flame, you may notice that there are some regions in which there is condensation forming on the cooler parts of the glass. The water that's producing that condensation is coming from the hot parts of the glass. And so if I succeed in heating up the entire flask on all sides with my flame adequately, I can drive off all of the moisture that's adhered to the surface of my 100 milliliter round bottom flask. Now the question comes up, exactly how much water did I eliminate? Well, to investigate this, I allowed the flask to cool in a desiccator and then placed it on an analytical balance and teared the flask. Next, I waited, and over a period of about 15 minutes, you'll notice the flask is gaining mass. The mass that this flask is gaining is coming from moisture from the atmosphere that is re-adhering to the surface of the glass through those interactions that we talked about earlier. And in my case, I got about 28 milligrams worth of water. Now, is that relevant? Well, let's think about that. If half of that water was on the inside of the walls of the flask, 
and I got about 28.2 milligrams worth of water, I can set up a calculation that illustrates that I managed to eliminate almost a tenth of a millimole of water just from that one piece of glassware. This may not sound like a lot, but when you think about the fact that we typically use this size glassware to run reactions on the millimole scale, this becomes a really considerable amount of moisture. So flame drying, not only our round bottom flasks in which we may run the reactions, but any glassware that our reagents may come in contact with can help us to mitigate the potential damage that water can do in certain chemical reactions. That's all for now, everyone. Thanks for watching. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And as always, I'll see you on my next video.